Um, this is an update on PCORI, as you know, a, a non-governmental agency created by the funding agency, research funding agency, uh, created by the Patient Protection and Affordable Care Act. From that legislation, you'll see that we have a, a, a broad mandate and it's about supporting decision making. So it's to assist patients, clinicians, purchasers, and policymakers in making informed health decisions. So that implies that one has a choice to do something or not to do it or to do this versus that. Um, and we do it through funding research, including evidence synthesis, and we also do it through dissemination of research findings. So that's kind of our, that's about as specific as the, le as the legislation gets. We could do research in any area where arguably there are choices to be made. But I'll show you one piece of evidence that explains maybe why I thought I'd be here. Research shall be designed as appropriate to take into account the potential for differences in effectiveness of healthcare treatments, services, and items as used with various subpopulations. And I, for this meeting, I also highlighted the part, that one of the ways that patient populations and subpopulation differ is genetic and molecular subtypes. So right in, in our legislation is the notion that we should be attending to that. So I always expected that we would. Um, uh, PCORI's Board of Governors was also mandated to come up with its uh, national priorities for research, and these are they. And again, you see the first one is assessment of prevention, diagnosis, and treatment options. Uh, and uh, I can't really see the screen from here, but I know that it says something about there. Uh, um, potential differences in response to, to uh, uh, therapy in patient subgroups. Uh, st and studies of patient preferences for various outcomes. So again, it seems like it has high relevance. But some of the other priorities also improving healthcare systems and the way that we support patients in doing self-care, we coordinate care uh, uh, and, uh, and evaluate uh, decision-making by patients. Uh, communication and dissemination research, the ways that information is shared between patients and clinicians and systems and shared decision-making is, is supported. And then addressing disparities. So uh, you'll see that uh, all four of those first, uh, the first four of the five priorities, uh, you can build a case um, that research into genomic medicine uh, could fit, um, different aspects of it could fit in those. I'll tell you a secret, uh, everybody else with their research interests sees the same thing, but nonetheless, um, that's part of being broad. Uh, and, and the fifth one is, uh, you may know, the fifth one is about building infrastructure for doing comparative effectiveness research. And you may know that we have a very large uh, initiative on the street right now, $70 million in total, and it encourages people to build system-based clinical data research networks that have, among other things, patient and clinician and system involvement in governance and the building of large clinical data uh, um, uh, repositories, uh, along with patient-reported data, and but certainly including biospecimens uh, in in the uh, in the mix of data. So all five of the priorities speak uh, seem to hold some promise for supporting research in the area of genetic medicine. We, uh, unlike uh, many uh, entities th uh, these days in D.C., we actually do have um, money uh, to spend. Um, this is how much flows into the PCORI Trust Fund each year, and then you see in 2013, 300 million flows into the Trust Fund, and beginning in 2014, 500 million. 20% of that comes off the top and goes back to HHS, but that leaves 80% uh, that PCORI itself uh, allocates, and we are uh, front-loading that funding, so we aim to commit about 350 million this year and about 500 million in each of the next two years. Um, and um, these are the uh, requirements we make of uh, applicants. Uh, that, in fact, uh, the research that you are proposing addresses a, qu a question that's relevant to choices faced by patients, clinicians, uh, I should, it should say policymakers, and that it considers patient relevant outcomes. So we put a lot of stock in, patients should be engaged as you formulate your research question and should endorse the outcomes that you're studying. So that does suggest that we want outcomes that patients would uh, resonate with, would say, are relevant. These studies indeed do need to be comparative. We're called upon to do comparative clinical effectiveness research. I think you had a little discussion this morning about cost effectiveness research, and we do not do cost effectiveness research. We tend to not um, measure qualities, and we certainly don't make recommend decisions about coverage on the basis of anything like qualities, but we absolutely do uh, fund and really only fund comparative clinical effectiveness research with the patient relevant outcomes. Uh, we, uh, the research, any research that comes to us has to speak to 
the possibility and ask the state how they will look, in fact, for possible differences in treatment effectiveness across population subgroups. Uh, it, th we look for research in real-world populations in relevant patients, including patients with multiple comorbid conditions, um, and, we and we insist that they include relevant patients and stakeholders on the research team. So this is something that's driven researchers a little um, uh, crazy. Uh, uh, just figuring, especially seasoned researchers. New researchers have no trouble figuring out how to do it because it's the first time they're putting teams together. But uh, people who've been doing research, NIH, ARC-funded research for a long, long time, pause when it comes to, when we, when they come to the part of the application guidelines about be sure that you've got patients and other relevant stakeholders, not as the subjects of your research, but on your research team. Um, uh, be sure and discuss in your research application the potential for dissemination and implementation, uh, and don't include, in fact, cost-effectiveness analysis, and don't really um, uh, compare overall costs either. And this is uh, just our working definition of comparative clinical effectiveness research. It's pretty much what I just showed you, but maybe a difference or two. Um, that it addresses practical questions, those of interest to patients and providers in particular, but policymakers too. Usually we're looking for head-to-head -head comparisons, but in, in this context here, it might be a comparison between doing genetic testing prior to making a treatment uh, assignment and, and, and not doing it. Uh, it's conducted in, in typical patients and typical care delivery systems. That's the kind of research we're looking for, considering the full range of outcomes of interest to patients, looking for the differences in treatment effectiveness. They may be um, RCTs. Uh, they may be observational studies. So I will just uh, say in closing, uh, that, um, that we have um, funded about $150 million in research already. We have standing announcements that are open. These are broad announcements to which we would be delighted to see uh, uh, submissions around uh, questions related to genetic medicine. And we also have now built a, a set of four advisory panels that advise us and help us prioritize questions that we would then target research and we would devote more research, more resources to a particular area. So we could have a discussion about the, the fact that we ought to have a specific initiative in genetic medicine if people felt that that was, that the time was ripe for that. But we are, you will see over time that PCORI will move from being almost exclusively uh, a funder that funds, uh, that issues broad solicitations, um, program announcements that solicit R01s, for example, toward an agency that has a good part of its portfolio dedicated to targeted areas, and one of them most certainly could be around genetic medicine. So I think I've um, said enough, and I will stop and entertain questions. Thank you very much, Joe. Yes, Mark. So, Joe, there's one thing um, that you didn't specifically mention that is probably worth bringing to this group, and that is the specific uh, call out for a rare disease focus as well. And I wonder if you could expand a bit on, on that and how that's being implemented by PCORI. Thanks, Mark. Um, well, the legislation also, uh, the legislation has a lot of um, language in it, uh, just, you know, a very small piece of the, uh, you know, a phrase, a sentence. but. Um, um, Patients with rare diseases are specifically called out in the legislation, and so we call them out in our uh, announcements. We are very interested in studies, and we would prioritize a study somewhat higher if it addressed a, a, a relevant question and it competed well in the in the reviews um, uh, for patients with a rare disease. We also, similarly, in our infrastructure um, award, we have a certain amount of that money is set aside for patient-powered networks, and those we're particularly interested in seeing patients, uh, patient organizations, patient communities with rare diseases apply. So yes, and, and I think, again, in the context of this group, that's a very relevant um, point to be aware of. Joe, I wonder if you could comment a bit about, you, you mentioned that genomic medicine might be a topic that PCORI would, would pursue. You're probably closer in touch with what patients are interested in than, than many of us are. Are you hearing from patients that this is an area of interest to them? No, I, I, Terry, I can't say that, that we have yet, no. Um, you know, there, there's something about the way that you bring patients together that, that I mean, I'm not sure, but it, it, it may not set it up for, the, for, for that. Um, patients often come in, they're, and they're patients with multiple conditions, and they may be talking more about access or communication. Um, I can't say that I've heard it. I'm, I'm, I'm sure prepared to believe that there are patient organizations out there that could put that 
that question in that case to us. Um, but I have not heard it yet. Because yeah, one could imagine that if, if it's only those that are, you know, the most active or loudest voices that are, that are getting to you, that's, you know, obviously a, a problem as well. And, and, you know, clearly the people that we hear from think this is great, yeah. but we don't Well, you should tell your people to yeah. talk to, yeah, that's, to ours. Um, <laughs> no, we, you know, we do have, among other things, a, a website where, where patients can submit questions. And I'm not, I haven't, they haven't been brought to my attention. I have not seen an application specifically about um, particularly genetic testing yet come to the, um, um, uh, to uh, our, um, uh, in response to our broad solicitations. I, I will say just uh, for those of you who work in the, in the, uh, in the grant writing and uh, world, that uh, the announcements right now are typically invite uh, proposals that, um, that cost up to about 1.5 million in direct costs and, and last for three years. So it's about a half a million a year for three years. Uh, we have some, certainly we have some flexibility to make things shorter. We, we're sometimes open to making things longer. We do like studies that, that promise some results in the, in the fairly near term. There's at least one in the next round. Good, good. Mark is, a, Mark is a distinguished himself among other ways by uh, being one of our committee chairs in our review sections and we're very uh, grateful for that. It's a, another way that researchers could, uh, could work with us, in fact, is to let us know you'd be interested in helping us review. So, yes. So one of the things I'm interested in is uh, you, you've indicated that you're intending to move from um, a more broad, investigator-initiated, uh, take-all-comers kind of approach to a more targeted approach. And you alluded to some committees that were helping advise you on that. Can you talk a little bit more about that process and, um, you know, how long you imagine that transition would take? And, and in particular, I'd be interested in, um, you know, we have a lot of genomic people that are interested in genomic medicine from a variety of uh, perspectives in this room. And one of the things we're thinking about is whether we need some kind of coordinated national policy. And so uh, how might that feed into that process as well? Well, l let me say this. You, you can go to our website and, uh, in fact, find out exactly who sits on these four advisory panels. A pretty... Uh, pretty impressive collections, each of the panels. Um, what they do is they, we receive input, suggestions for research questions from a variety of sources. We receive them via the web. We receive them via interactions with professional societies, patient organizations, payers. Um, and uh, we have program directors assigned, uh, scientists with input Corey assigned to each of the uh, priority areas. And they process these. And uh, there, there's, a, um, there's a, a process of shrinking them down to the ones that are really comparative, removing the redundancies, uh, and, and picking the, and then doing some preliminary landscape assessment to see which ones really aren't already known, which ones uh, have some likelihood of benefiting from some primary research. And, th and then we prepare topic briefs on those, and these topic briefs go to the prioritiz prioritization, the advisory panels, which do prioritization. And they have very robust discussions. I think over time you will see the advisory panels bringing questions directly to us. I think you'll see our scientists, our, our program leaders, um, bringing questions to us, uh, to the advisory panel. So uh, they then submit the questions to the board. Board may say, do a little more investigation, but ultimately the board then approves those topic areas that we move forward with explicit um, announcements on. It's known that we have an announcement coming out shortly on um, uh, the treatment of uh, severe asthma in minority populations, and we have one coming out on the prevention of falls in the elderly, to, and, and probably likely one coming out um, on uh, treatment options for uterine fibroids. So those are, those are three areas that, uh, um, the three of our very first targeted areas. The reason I ask about this, one of the things I was really struck by is as you went through some of your earlier slides, it really talked a lot about how to identify subpopulations. And um, I, I think Dan Roden was talking earlier today about um, the warfarin work uh, where it benefits, it may only benefit 20 percent of those people, but for those 20, 2 percent of those of people, um, but for those 2 percent, uh, it's, it's, it makes a huge difference. So, I mean, is that the kind of thing? <coughs> comparing those, that subpopulation to the subpopulation, the, the, the broader population at large where that signal might very likely get swamped out is. Yeah, yeah. I, I would say that's precisely, you know, why um, 
the legislation emphasized it, and it's certainly why we emphasize it, the vision, and genetic medicine fits right into this vision, I think, that over time you begin targeting particular therapies um, toward that subgroup that really stands to benefit, and, and uh, you, know, you find something else for the subgroup that doesn't. So uh, that notion is, is really, that's a notion that's pretty widespread in the uh, legislation. I think it was maybe in some ways put in there as an antidote to any simplistic view that comparative effectiveness research was just about comparing means, finding no difference, paying for the cheaper one and not covering the, the more expensive one. So but between you and, and me, me and all of you, I think that's kind of how the language got in there. But it's quite exciting language. Uh, I'm sure you would agree that the, the vision that, that one person with diabetes is not uh, like everybody else with diabetes and treatments may really, we know that treatments do work differently. So that vision of eventually getting the right medication to the right person is kind of a mantra, the right treatment. And it, and it works just as well in system interventions as it does with medications, too. You know, system interventions don't work the same for everyone either, so. Great. All right. Thank you very much. Joe, I hope Thank you can you. stay with us for the, the rest of the afternoon. Uh, next, we have Huyen Curry, who's, who will be speaking for the CDC, but also uh, wears a hat at the NCI, and so you can get a little bit of both of those.